You're listening to Sasquatch Syndicate. Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? Or I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. And all the ape believers don't want any of the paranormal believers to say anything because they're all whacked and screwed up and we don't want them. And all the paranormal believers don't want to go to the ape believers saying, well, you're all closed minded. You're not open to the fact that that, that it does this and it does that. And I look over my left shoulder and this creature is running through the woods and it's bulldozing the brush down. And I knew, man, this thing is going to get me. Sasquatch Syndicate. I'm your host, Chuck, out in Seattle, Washington, along with Paul in Portland, Oregon. Thanks to everyone for listening and those following us at SasquatchSyndicate.com and on our social media outlets. So on to this month's podcast, I know many of you wrote in and gave us some great feedback. And uh, I wanted to bring Tim back because he had a lot more to uh, tell the audience about his adventures. And I wanted to continue on with the discussion, but at the same time, I wanted to give Tim a little bit of time to go out to sasquatsyndicate.com, check out our faces section, because he's had a lot of visual encounters, and I think it's really good to sometimes give all of us a visual reference on really what that individual saw. And so if you have time and you want to follow along tonight, go out to sasquatsyndicate.com, hit explore, and then the scientific area, and you'll find our faces section. And it's one of the wider collections out on the internet. A lot of great work there from David Schlosser and team to really uh, depict some of the visual encounters and things they've heard over the years. So that'll give us all a little bit of a reference uh, as Tim kind of gets us through the faces section tonight. So, so Tim, welcome back to the program again. Uh, thanks for the latest adventure update. I know before we came on the air, we talked a little bit about the Kootenai, Northern Idaho, you know, all the wildlife, you know, you had been seeing, you know, but there's so much out there for a live primate to live on in that entire area oh yeah there's i mean everything's up there i i always see elk deer moose uh occasional bear for some reason i've been running into cougar the last couple years and uh you know the whole theory well why aren't you finding any skeletons of them they have to die Uh, i don't know about you but when i go up in april in the april early may i i find i don't know probably at least three to four carcasses of elk or moose, and within two weeks, they're totally gone. There's not even a trace they were dead there. Oh, yeah, we've uh, experienced that as well. You know, you, you'll stumble across an old carcass, and like you said, you know, um, it's gone pretty fast. I think, you know, everybody always says, you know, nature's pretty efficient, but you've got about 21 days before the scavengers and Mother Nature takes over, and, and it's just gone. I mean, not even a bone. And then you got the wolves to contend with, which I thought odd because the wolves seem to be around the Bigfoots. Now, I found a lot of wolf tracks by Bigfoot tracks. Yeah, it's pretty common, you know, if a creature, you know, like a bear or a Sasquatch were to take down a kill, you know, the the wolves are going to come around and try to scavenge as well, you know. And, um, you know, of course, you also got game trails to contend with and other things. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty common, you know, to find Sasquatch prints intermingled you know, with other animal tracks, just depending on the area and substrate you're on. Right. The uh, I know they like huckleberries. I found giant piles of scat with their footprint in it. Tim, have you ever, you know, set camera traps or tried to out-tech some of these creatures? Yes, I did. And when I did that, I would never, I never seen them for over a month. Not, not a sign of them. It's my belief is. They know I'm I'm coming before I get there. I'm sure they hear me. You know, they, they hear the vehicle or whatever. But when I put that camera up, I put two of them up, and I never seen any signs. I took it down. About a month later, I was starting to see sign again. I I I think they I I believe they watch you more than you're watching them. 
Yeah, Paul and I have definitely had uh, similar experiences when we're out. And, you know, you put in uh, camera traps. You know, that's something foreign in their environment. And that's somewhere they live, you know, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, right? And so they're going to find that pretty quickly. And even a couple of years back, you know, we'd done an experiment with the University of Washington where we had a, you know, a large field where we had a lot of animals. We placed some foreign objects and those animals came straight up to that. Uh, for about 60 days before that they just started walking by it like it wasn't, you know, there wasn't anything there. And I'd love to hear what other researchers are doing as well. But, you know, the other piece is, you know, when you first hook up those camera traps and they've got batteries and the shutters, you know, got to keep alive on it. You know, you're also introducing electronic interference. So we've been at least trying to put stuff out and leave it sit 60, 90 days before we even put batteries and SD cards in it and just get it, uh, you know, the creatures in that area pretty familiar with it. And um, when they get a little comfortable, we try to sneak out and get the batteries and, like I said, get the SD cards in and get them loaded up and start that way. And then you're only replacing the batteries. But uh, again, you know, if you're a researcher out there and you've got a, a better way to do it, please let us know. You can contact the show at contact at sasquatsyndicate.com. So, Tim, uh, have you ever tried to use animals or uh, tried to track with dogs or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I thought about trying to find somebody with dogs to see but i i just don't think I, I don't know if you could actually a dog would even catch up to it or if it did you know what would happen because i got a friend that runs bear with dogs and i always thought about asking him if if the dog would catch the scent and be able to follow it but but then again i don't want too many people up there because i don't want to scare them away yeah, that's pretty common with researchers, you know, even, you know, for us, we've got our research areas and you don't want to inject a lot of variables, you know, to the area with other people tromping around or, you know, moving things out of place, et cetera. And if you're going to do real good data analysis, right, you want some constants and try to avoid as many variables as possible. So, you know, I don't think that that's uncommon. Tim, kind of going back to, you know, the scat that you found, you know, with the footprint in it and, you know, there's a lot of wild berries up there, huckleberries, blueberries, et cetera, lots for you know, bears to survive on. And of course, you know, where we hear, you know, there's berries, we hear of Sasquatch as well. So just curious kind of what you've seen up there and observed. I, I don't believe their diet consists of just meat. I just, I don't think they eat a lot of meat. Uh, I think they eat meat, but uh, I think they eat a lot of vegetation. Because I, I even called, the, there's a, I called the Idaho Fishing Game, I took a uh, fishing game officer up to the location. And she happened to be a, a plant expert. And she was telling me about all the plants, what they can do, what, you know, what they're good for and everything. And then it started all kind of making sense that that's why they were in that area. So, Tim, just kind of going back to your trek, you know, you're leaving here from Washington State. You're driving in northern Idaho. You get up there. Are you sleeping in your Jeep um, in the area or what's kind of your routine? I, I never stay where they are. I never do. I always go back. To, I drive back down to a small town, uh, about two two hours and fifteen minutes away. Um, I, I never stay where they are. I just don't think that's good. I I don't want to spook them away, and I don't want a nighttime encounter. So yeah. So just kind of getting back to your routine. So are you? Getting up there every morning at the same time, like do you get up at 5 a.m. and always show up at the same time? I mean, what's kind of your MO? No. No, it varies. The time difference varies. I always thought, uh, you know, early morning because some of, a lot of the photographs I got were uh, pretty uh, between 7 and 9 o'clock in the morning. So for whatever reason, I figured that's the only time they were around, but that's not true because the uh rock incident i think i took that picture uh, right around 11 or 12 o'clock and the whole nocturnal thing i i don't know i mean i i, I don't know if they are nocturnal I, they're moving during the day too because that's when i see them either that or i'm disturbing them have you uh have you tried, do you do calls at all? Yeah, we don't really. And uh, I think many of you guys know I'm a birder and um, definitely uh, specialize in owls. And that's kind of my forte. But um, 
I've definitely heard screams, you know, for the longest time, you know, over the years, you know, we, we tried all the howls, everything you see on TV, et cetera. But, you know, after you have some really um, compelling evidence, you no longer really need to do that. You know, we're trying to capture great visual images and video. And so that's really what we're focused on now. But, um, you know, there's a lot of owls out there in the Olympics making a lot of noise. There's a lot of birds out there, but we were exiting, uh, you know, last July and it was a deafening scream, you know, and it cleared all the birds out of the forest and just into dead silence. I mean, I still get goosebumps and the hair stands up on my arms, <laughs> you know, when I think about that, but we've definitely heard the calls and heard the screams, um, but we're not doing them anymore. And uh, the reason we're not doing that is, you know, uh, one night we were making a lot of noise, you know, doing just about everything you could think of, you know, in terms of being obnoxious out in the forest. But, you know, we had a bear walk up on us. And, um, you know, I pretty much learned from that experience that, you know, you're better off just keeping your ears open and um, listening to nature. You know, there's a lot of creatures out there that are really kind of the uh, alarm clocks of the forest. You know, you've got birds, owls, you name it. But, um, you know, keep your ears open if something major is coming through. You're going to know about it. Birds and uh, squirrels and chipmunks, they, they definitely sound the alarm. When I was 17, I was trying to get back to, uh, I was elk hunting with my brothers, and I was trying to get back to camp, and it was starting to get dusk, and I was getting worried because I was still about a mile and a half from camp, and I'm coming up out of a canyon, and I'm just following the trail, getting worried because it's getting dark, and I didn't want to get lost. And I had a female scream. I never seen her, but I know it was a female because it sounded just like a female. The percussion from the power of that scream went through me like being at a concert. It, it literally, I didn't stay standing for whatever reason, it dropped me right to my knees. And that's the first and last time I've ever heard a scream. Yeah, sounds like you might have got hit with the dose of infrasound there. Um, have you heard any other things while you've been out there? I've only heard wood knocks twice in my life. And I I believe wood knocks are telling the others somebody's coming. I never do wood knocks because I believe, again, that's telling them somebody's coming. I, I just don't believe it's a way of them communicating, hey, I'm over here. I, I don't think so. So, Tim, what about um, calls? Have you done any screams or howls? I mean, what's your technique? Well, the, I believe in the uh, screaming at them because I, I know for a fact it brings them to the edge of the forest. That's that's how I've gotten every picture almost that I've gotten. Um, it does bring them to the edge of the woods. Now, I'm 100% positive of that. You know, going back to that image, and I posted it out on All Access for those subscribed so you guys can check it out, but it's one of the better images anybody's ever submitted to the show. You know you think about Gigantopithecus and, you know, Grover Krantz, you know, said biped or quadruped, but that thing's down on all fours. At least it looks like to me, I'm not sure what you thought, Tim. By the tracks, it was on all fours, except for one hand, but its two feet and hands were planted in the ground. Its right hand was on the ground, its two feet were on the ground, but its left hand wasn't on the ground. So kind of thinking back on those tracks, you know, was it in a runner's position? I mean, were the tracks more of the ball of the feet and the curl of the toes? I mean, how was it positioned? Well, because when it took off, it just moved the dirt. I mean, it, 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 like someone took, took your hand and just pushed the dirt backwards. Kind of like a runner almost, yes. But where its back feet was, I couldn't get anything you could kind of see the toes a little bit, but the only definite impression was the hand. And I don't know if that's because when it took off, it made that, you know, how it pushed the dirt. Because the Rocky Mountains are nothing but rock and dirt. Yeah, I've had um, some suspicious looking tracks that could have been knuckles or hands, but I never casted them. But were you able to get a cast of that? See, I, I never carried plaster for probably five years and I just started carrying it. Uh, they make like a half gallon thing of it. So I started carrying that in a bucket of water. Cause I mean, I, I guess I've never been interested in casting it. I don't really know how to, 
my, my biggest interest is to get them on camera or film to, <laughs> I, I want to get close enough to see their faces definitely, you know what I mean? But I, I don't know if that'll ever happen because the closest I've ever gotten was probably, like I said, within 200 yards. Yeah, and just uh, maybe a tip, and for the researchers out there, you guys might have some other advice as well, but um, I've been just carrying, it's called Perfect Cast, and it's four and five pound bags, um, but, you know, four of those split across a couple guys. I mean, it's pretty light, you know, packs are heavy enough with water and all the supplies and whatnot, but it definitely has lightened our load quite a bit versus trying to figure out how much ultra cal and other things to carry or trying to come back. Do you, have you guys tried Fleur yet? Yeah, well, not as much as we used to. Um, you know, as we get older, you know, navigating the forest, um, it's tough enough during the day, let alone at night. So, uh, but we have set out in the distance on fields and in tree stands and other things, you know, with FLIR technology, but we did it on a rental. I mean, that stuff's pretty expensive. Exactly. That's the reason I, 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 I almost did it this year. Then the COVID came, uh, I was uncertain how everything was going to go. I was going to get one off of Amazon uh, because I wanted to I wanted to see if they're actually active at night. And I figured the FLIR would be the best thing in, you know, picking up heat signature. Well, you know, certainly some of the good FLIR gear, you know, like the Scouts or the, you know, some of the, some of the heavier stuff that they have, you know, the binoculars. I mean, those that stuff's pretty good. But, you know, I've been using... Um, some FLIR devices that just clip to the iPhone. The difficulty is, unless you're really, really close, it's hard to make it out. It's almost a blob. I mean, you can tell if something's standing or down on all fours, but the clarity of it is just not as great. Yeah, the ones on the phones, when I did a little research on them, um, you got to be pretty close, and I don't want to be that close. I mean, uh, like, again, they've never been violent towards me. I'm 100% positive they could have took me at any time. Because most of the time I'm by myself, and I, I don't want to get that close. After finding that moose with its head ripped off, I, I really don't want to get that close. I certainly can't blame you there. All right, we're going to take a short break again. If you're listening out on YouTube, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon for all the latest. All right, well, welcome back. And while we were out on break there, Tim and I were just, you know, talking about <laughs> the inability to be able to sneak up on these things. But Tim, you were just, you know, mentioning, um, you know, how smart you thought they were. Uh, they, they, they have to have some, they're, they're very intelligent. They know who we are. They know what a rifle is, that I'm positive of. I'm sure they've seen enough hunters in the woods killing elk. I'm pretty sure they know what a rifle is. So, Tim, you know, just kind of thinking about, you know, your experience there in northern Idaho. And when we were over there a couple of years back, you know, we met with, uh, you know, Shoshone and Paiutes and Kootenai. And, you know, you can only get them really to tell you that, you know, the creature's physical while it's here on Earth. And it kind of leaves it open for discussion. But do you get the feeling that this thing is... Man, ape, paranormal? I mean, what are your feelings? I, I don't think ape at all. Um, there's a, oh, I can't remember his name. He opened up a little museum in Olympia. Uh, there's a little museum, and he moved all these Bigfoot stuff in there. And he's all, this is about two years ago he did that. And he's all about thinking everything's an, it's an ape. And I, I don't believe that. I, I think there's some kind of a human. I think they've been around for a very, very long time. And if you read, you know, the stories like John LeFleur, who uh, I believe that was in Montana or Oregon, where the cavalry thought that the Indians were stealing their kids and the Indians thought the white men were stealing the kids. Anyway, when they hashed it out, they figured out it was the Bigfoots, and that's when they went charging him, and the Bigfoot ripped him off his horse and ripped his head off. And it was some cavalry captain, John LaFleur. And after reading that story, then seeing that uh, moose with his head ripped off, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. 
I, I, I believe there's some kind of there's some kind of human. I, I think they're a caveman. Yeah, well, we've definitely had a lot of encounters called in over the years, you know, and the witness describes the creature as, you know, some type of, I would just say an archaic homo sapien, you know, who knows, Neanderthal, whatever. But, you know, we get a lot of descriptions in that regard. Exactly. I, I don't see, I don't see the eight thing in, in them. They're, the faces that I see, they're not, I don't see ape, I see human. Uh, human looking. Like I said, two of them, the younger ones, they to me they look like a troll. Uh, if you, uh, what was that show? Oh, God, I can't. It's the Witch Hunter, and they Hansel and Gretel, and Gretel finds the troll that helps them. That's what reminds me of them. Yeah, and I just had uh, our marketing department flip you the link um, if you want to check your email. But, again, if you're out on the faces area of the website, maybe, Tim, you can just kind of take us through some of the images and maybe describe kind of what you've seen. And, again, I'll also post those images out on all access on the website. This uh, image, image 21 the, the skin color is kind of spot on. But whatever their skin in their face is lighter. Uh, no, not that guy. Uh, 41, they have a huge, image 41, they have huge nostrils. They have a huge flat nose. No, that one looks demonic. Now, this image 44, uh, see, he's got the beard, but he ain't got, like, the mustache. The, one I, the, the big male had more hair on his face than that. I mean, I see similarities, but not exactly what I'm seeing. Image 48 is pretty, pretty good, too, especially the skin, the color. Have you guys tried to... Uh, Leave any kind of food for them? Yeah, I've been um, pretty consistent, and we didn't get out a lot this year, but um, definitely in the area we have traps up, you know, camera traps and whatnot, we've got uh, definitely uh, a frequency of apples and an orchard bag and some things like that. Um, but, you know, certainly other than trying to get one on film taking an apple, you know, they're going to get scattered by scavengers, raccoons, you know, whatever else might be out there. but. I try to stay consistent and just uh, continue to bring the same types of apples as well. The well, last time I was there, I put apples around a stump and I dumped a bag of flour around the stump uh, to see if I see any footprints. Uh, the problem with that was I never got to go. I never got to go back the next morning. Um, I got injured during the war, and I have some medical problems, so uh, I, sometimes I can't, I can't move like I used to. Uh, like you, I'm in my 50s. By the way, I just had them send over image 18 if you weren't able to find it. I know there's quite a few out there, but um, take a look at that one. What do you think of that? Um, I mean, yeah, a little. It, it's mouth bigger, though. The last year's one. Last year was the first year I took a picture of one that it looked, it had a huge, it had a huge mouth on it. And I'd never seen him that I can remember that I, I never had a photograph of it. But it, the one that popped out and was kneeling or down on its knees had a very large mouth. Like it, it reminded me of a, uh, it was the first time I thought, uh, gorilla. And I'm looking through all your pictures to see. Yeah, I was looking for one that's a little bit wider nose, wider mouth. 79 kind of comes to mind. I don't know how much demonic. Yeah, where, I've seen it in here. It reminded me of the one I got last year. 55. His nose isn't isn't there, but his mouth is. His mouth is, the one I see in his mouth a little bigger. It had a very 
There it is, 17. It had a mouth. His lips are more, the one I took a picture of, his lips are more defined than 17, but he had a mouth, a big mouth like that. And a bigger nose, a big flat nose. I, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever been on a reservation and met any old Indians before, but they have large, no, flat like noses. Kind of like 77, but it's lit, it had lips. This 77 doesn't have any lips. I mean, they're there, but they're not pronounced. Yeah, I thought 1679 might be interesting as well. Yeah, this this 79. Now that looks a lot closer with the with the with the nose and more pronounced lips. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks again for coming on tonight. We really do appreciate it. Thanks again for giving us uh, kind of a description on what you've seen. You know, and, you know, using our faces collection, I think it's a great way to give listeners kind of an idea on, you know, really what people are seeing out there. And uh, again, I've got the actual pictures. They are up on SasquatchSyndicate.com under all access. And uh, Tim's got some great, great, you know, pictures. So take a peek at those. Let us know what you think. But um, we're going to have Tim back on again. And, uh, Tim, we really appreciate you coming on Sasquatch Syndicate. And uh, we'll catch up with you very, very soon. All right. Have a good day. This concludes our August 2019 podcast. Sasquatch Syndicate will return on Sunday, September 1st. Thanks to all of our listeners and those that have been out to our website and those following us 